Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on introduction to limits. So remember, from the previous video, we talked about finding a value of a limit graphically using this graph or using a table of values, which was finding a limit numerically. We also talked about the existence of a limit using one-sided limits and a two-sided limit. Now we're going to talk about how do you find the value of a limit using algebraic methods. So we're going to use properties of limits called limit laws to evaluate limits analytically or algebraically. And then we're also going to talk about how do you determine the value of a limit, if the limit exists, of a rational function that gives you what's called an indeterminate form of type 0 divided by 0. So let's start off using the limit laws or properties of limits. So even though we can use graphs and tables to find the value of a limit for a function, we can also find out the value of a limit for a function using algebraic methods. So these are called the limit laws. So it says, suppose that k is a constant, so just any real number, and that the limit as x approaches c from either direction, the left or the right side of x equals c, of the function, the y values approach l, and then you have a different function, g of x, the limit of g of x as x approaches the same value x equals c, the y values approach m. So these two are given conditions where l and m are real numbers, then these are called the limit laws, and there are seven of them. So number one, it's important to understand what the limit laws say. You don't actually need to memorize these seven laws, just understand how to use them. So limit law number one says the limit of x approaching c from either direction of just a constant k stays just the constant k. So if it's just a real number that you're taking the limit of, it will turn out that the limit is just that number. Property number two says if the function is just x, so f of x equals x or y equals x, and your x values are approaching c, so if the y values are x and the x values are approaching c, then so does your y values. The y values also approach c. Property 3 is a condition that we will use very often. It says the limit as x approaches c of a sum or a difference of two different functions. So imagine that you have a function with many terms in it, and they're separated by pluses or minuses. Well, then the property says, if you're taking the limit of a sum or a difference of functions or terms, you can find out the limit of each one separately, but keep the sign between the limits. So x approaching c the, of f of x, the limit will be l, and the limit of x approaching c of g of x was m, so then you'll have l plus or minus m for the limit of the sum or the difference of two functions. Okay, property number four says, the limit as x approaches c of some constant times a function. So imagine that you're taking a number times a function, so like three times the whole function f of x. What can you do? Well, the constant can be taken outside the limit. So you can find out the limit of f of x as x, x approaches c. That was l. And then you can multiply l by k later. Okay, property number five. It's very similar to property number three, except you have a product instead of a sum or a difference. The limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x. So you have a product of two functions multiplied together. You can find the limit of each function separately as x approaches c, and then multiply your answers together, which is really nice. So you can find the limit of a simpler function and get l. You can find out the limit of this other function, which is m, and then multiply your answers at the end. Property number six is for quotients. So we'll be seeing a lot of these types of problems in the examples. The limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by g of x is the limit of the numerator function, which is f of x as x approaches c, divided by the limit of the denominator function, so limit as x approaches c of g of x. Well, the limit of f of x was l, the limit of g of x was m as x approaches c, so the limit of this fraction, f of x divided by g of x, is l divided by m. Now, this limit exists provided that your denominator is not zero. And then property number seven says, how do you take the limit when you have radicals? The limit as x approaches c of the nth root or the nth radical of f of x. You can take the limit inside the radical, the limit as x approaches c of the function f of x, and then you can take the nth root of that limit. So you'll get the nth root of l. So again, just like number six, sometimes the limit might not exist. So we have to be a little careful this, with this. If n is an even, so that means you have an even root, square roots, fourth roots, sixth roots, and so on, what's on the inside of an even root must be a positive number, because we know that we can't take an even root of a negative number. They must be real numbers for the limits. Okay, so even though 
all seven of these properties involving limit laws was x approaching c, you can replace x approaching c with x approaching c from the left, or you can replace with x approaching c from the right, and you'll still get the same seven limit laws. They apply for one set of limits as well as two sided limits. All right, example five. We're going to start using the limit laws or properties of limits to find out how to find limits algebraically. So find each of the following limits. So as we use the limit law, I'm going to write out off to the side what law we actually used from the previous page. So problem number one, find the limit as x approaches four, so your x values are approaching four from the left and from the right, and the function is just f of x equals 11, or y equals 11. Well, this was limit law number one. If your function is just a constant, like 11 is, or just a real number, then the limit will be 11. Okay, number two. The limit as x approaches negative 6 and your function is x. So f of x equals x or y equals x. So this was limit law number 2. If your function is just x and the x values was approaching c, the limit was just c. Well, so x approaches negative 6, that means the limit will also be negative 6. So in problems 3, 4, 5, and 6, we'll be using properties number 1 and 2 quite often. So number 3. Find the limit as x approaches 1 of the function 5x minus 2, and that's in parentheses to indicate that's the entire function. So which property can we use here? We could actually use several. So notice that there are two different terms inside the parentheses. So imagine that you have two different functions that are being subtracted from one another. You can use the limit law number 3 to separate them out. So you can rewrite this as limit as x approaches 1. So you can make sure that you're still approaching the same value on the x-axis. So x approaches 1 from both directions of the first function 5x. Keep the sign between the two limits, and then you have limit of x approaches 1 of the other function, which was just 2. Then we can use property number 4 to deal with the constant times x. So notice that you have not just x as the function, you have 5 times x, so that's a constant times a function. So you can take 5 outside the limit using property number 4. So 5 times the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus, and just keep the second limit the same, limit as x approaches 1 of just 2. Now notice that we, we're simplifying these limits down so that we can use limit laws number 1 and 2. The first function is just x, and the other function was just now 2. We can use property number 1 for the limit laws to find out the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 is just 2. And now finding out the limit as x approaches 1 of x, we know will just be 1. So 5 times 1 subtract 2 will just give you 3. So this function, 5x minus 2, the y values will be approaching 3 when x is approaching 1 from either the left side or the right side of x equals 1. All right, let's try number 4. You want to find the limit as x approaches 4 of 3x plus 2 as one function times another function, negative 4x minus 3. So this time we can use limit law number 5 because we have a product of two different types of functions. You have 3x plus 2 as one function, so limit as x approaches 4 of 3x plus 2 times the other limit of the other function. So limit as x approaches 4 also of negative 4x minus 3. So notice that we are rewriting a product of two functions into a product of the two limits. So now we can just rewrite this like we were doing problem number 3. So you can rewrite this as there's 3x plus 2. That's two different functions that are being added. So I can rewrite this as limit of 3x as x approaches 4 and limit of 2 as x approaches 4. So that's the first limit, and then we have times, limits, and then again, there's two different terms, so you can rewrite these as limit of each term separately as x approaches 4. So x approaches 4 of negative 4x minus, keep the sign between them, limit of 3 as x approaches 4. So we saw earlier that you can take out the 3 outside the limit using limit law number 4. So you have 3 times the limit of just x is left over as x approaches 4 plus keep that limit of x approaching 4 of 2 the same, times, same reason, this negative 4 is just a constant times x, so the constant can be taken outside the limit, so negative 4 times the limit of x as x approaches 4, and then subtract the limit of 3 as x approaches 4. So we're, again, we're trying to reduce these down so that the function is just a constant, or the function is just x. So now we have that, so you have 3 times the limit as x approaches 4 of x, well, if the function is just x, then and your x is approaching 4, the limit will be 4. So 3 times 4 plus, and we found out this property earlier as well, if the function is just a constant, 
the limit will just be that constant. So the limit as x approaches 4 of 2 will just be 2. And then same reason for the other set of parentheses. Negative 4 times limit as x approaches 4 of x will be 4. So negative 4 times 4 minus limit as x approaches 4 of 3 will just be 3. So 3 times 4 plus 2 times, and in parentheses, negative 4 times 4 minus 3. Now notice, I haven't said this before in the previous video or the last three examples. Whenever you find out what the y values are approaching, whenever you use properties number 1 and 2, notice that's where you drop the limit notation. So we found out the limit of x as x approaches 4 was just 4, so I dropped the limit notation and just replaced it with a 4. And the limit as x approaches 4 of 2, we knew the limit was 2. The y values approach 2. Same reason in the other set of parentheses. So now, if you just do the arithmetic, 3 times 4 is 12, plus 2 gives you 14. The other set of parentheses, negative 4 times 4 is 16, minus 3 will give you negative 19 total. And then 14 times negative 19, these y values are approaching negative 266 for this function. The original function, the y values are approaching negative 266 as x is approaching 4. Okay, so we saw a product. Now let's try number 5. Number 5 has a quotient. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of a fraction. 5x plus 4 divided by negative 2x minus 1. So again, you can find out the limit of the numerator and denominator separately. So limit as x approaches negative 3 of 5x plus 4. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of the denominator, negative 2x minus 1. So again, use properties 1, 2, 3, and 4 so that you can reduce the function so that you just have x or just a constant. So rewrite this as a sum of two limits. The denominator, rewrite this as a difference of two limits because of the subtraction sign between the two. Take out the constant 5 away from the x, so bring it out to the front. Same thing in the denominator, take out the negative 2 away from the x, because that's just a constant times x. Bring it out to the front, so you have negative 2 times the limit. And then the limits will just be x, or the limit will just have a constant. That's what you're looking for. You want to have those broken down into just a limit of just x or a constant. So the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x is 5 times negative 3. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of 4 is just 4. So 5 times negative 3 plus 4 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have negative 2 times limit as x approaches negative 3 of x. Well, that will turn out to be negative 2 times negative 3. And then minus the limit as x approaches negative 3 of 1. That's just a constant. So the y values will approach that constant, 1. So the denominator will be negative 2 times negative 3 minus 1. And if you simplify, you'll have negative 11 fifths. The limit is what the y values are approaching for the function, the original function. So this function, that's a fraction, is approaching, the y values are approaching negative 11 fifths as x gets close to negative 3 on the x-axis. All right, let's try one more. We haven't actually talked about radicals yet, or roots. So number 6, limit as x approaches negative 2 of the square root 3x plus 7. So again, keep in mind that property number 7 in the limit law said if you're dealing with the square roots, you need to make sure that what's on the inside of the root is a positive number after you find out the limit. So if you use the limit law number 7, it said you can take the root at the end. So pass the limit to the inside of the root. So square root of limit as x approaches negative 2 of 3x plus 7 is the function. Now you can use all the limit laws that we've used before. So you have two terms, separate them out with two different limits. Limit as x approaches negative 2 of the first function, 3x, or the first term. Keep the sign between them, plus limit as x approaches negative 2 of 7. And again, you have 3 times x, so pull the 3 out to the front of that limit. 3 times limit as x approaches negative 2 of just x, plus, and keep the other limit the same, Keep in mind that all of this is inside the root because we passed the limit to the inside of the square root at the very first step. So inside the square root, you have 3 times the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x is negative 2. So 3 times negative 2. And the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 7 is just the constant 7. So square root of 3 times negative 2 plus 7, which is negative 6 plus 7, inside the square root is a positive number. So that's good. So you have square root of 1 and square root of 1 is 1. This means that the original function, the root function, square root 3x plus 7, this function, the y values are approaching 1 when the x values are approaching negative 2. If you did this problem using graphs 
or if you actually did this problem using a table of values, the limits will actually be the same. It's just using the algebra might make the problem a little bit faster. So what you found out from the previous example is that if you use the limit laws, the properties one through seven, the goal at the end is that you're trying to get the limit of just X or the limit of just a constant. So let's try this problem out. Let's try out if you have a function that is a polynomial or a rational function. We'll talk about rational functions in a second. So let's say you have the function f of x is this polynomial function, 5x squared plus 3x plus 7. So just some arbitrary polynomial. And c is a real number. So this time we're going to find out what is the limit as x approaches c, where we don't know what the c, what the value of c is. It's just any real number. How can we use the limit laws to find out a shortcut to find limits using algebraic methods. If you find out the limit as x approaches c of this quadratic or polynomial function, let's use all the limit laws. So you have three different terms. You can rewrite this into three separate limits. Limit as x approaches c of the first term, 5x squared, plus, keep the signs between them the same, limit as x approaches c of the middle term, 3x, plus, limit as x approaches c of just the constant term, 7. And then remember from the previous example, or the limit law number 4, is that if you have a constant times a function, the constant can be taken outside that limit. So 5 times x squared, I could take the 5 and multiply by the limit. So 5 times the limit as x approaches c of just x squared, plus, same reason, I can take the 3 outside that limit, 3 times the limit as x approaches c of just x, left over, plus, and then the limit of just 7. 7 is a constant, so let's just leave it alone, as x approaches c. So you'll have 5 times c squared, because we found out the limit, you can drop the limit notation, plus, we know that the limit of x as x approaches c will just be c, so 3 times c, plus the limit of a constant will always be that constant. It'll just be 7. So you'll simplify, and you can get up, you will come up with 5c squared, plus 3c plus 7, and that's using the last laws 1 and 2. Okay, now that was a lot of work using the limit laws. We use law number 3, 4, 1, and 2 to simplify this to find out these y values for this function are approaching 5c squared plus 3c plus 7 as x approaches c from the left side or the right side of x equals c. Well, there is a shortcut. There's a huge shortcut. If you look at this original function, how does this compare with the what we come up what we came up with for the limit? It looks like you can just replace all these x values with c. So whatever you're approaching on the x-axis, if this is a polynomial function, you can just replace all the x's with c's. 5 times c squared, 3 times c, and then 7 stayed 7. So instead of using all these limit laws every single time, if it's a polynomial function, you can just plug in whatever you're approaching on the x-axis into that polynomial function. So your y value is 5c squared plus 3c plus 7. That's exactly what the limit was. So what this means is that if the function that you're trying to find the limit of is a polynomial function and your x is approaching c on the x-axis, you can find out the limit by replacing the x value by c and just evaluate the function at x equals c. Okay, so that was for polynomial functions. For rational functions, it's, just, it's slightly different. So if your function f of x is a rational function, that means you have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So f of x is of this form, p of x divided by q of x. So you have some polynomial in the numerator and q of x is some polynomial in the denominator. So p of x and q of x are polynomials, but you have this additional property. When you have the denominator evaluated at c, it cannot be zero. Okay, we'll see that in a second why that's important. You can determine the limit of the entire function. You can find out the limit of this fraction by, again, replacing all the x values by c. So limit to the polynomial and rational functions. This just summarizes what we just found out. If the function is a polynomial function, c is any real number, the limit as x approaches c of a polynomial, you can just take the x out and replace with a c. And that's what the y values are approaching, f of c. Okay. On the other hand, if your function is a rational function and the denominator is not zero when you replace the x with a c, you can do the same thing. The limit as x approaches c of this rational function, so 
this fraction, p of x divided by q of x, you can take all the x's and replace them with a c to find out the limit. All right, so figure out how to actually use what this statement is actually saying. Let's look at example six, evaluating limits. This will make using the limit laws very, very quick. So find each of the following limits. The limit as x approaches 2 of this function, 4x squared plus 8x minus 3. Notice that this is a polynomial function. It's a quadratic function because the highest power on the x is a 2. So we can use this property. The first property says that you can replace all the x values by what the x values are approaching in the limit. So since I'm approaching 2, I can replace all these x values with 2. So 4 times 2 squared plus 8 times 2 minus 3. And now I can evaluate what that number is. So notice that I've dropped the limit notation because the property says I don't have limit anymore. I can just take the function and evaluate at C. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the function and evaluating at X equals 2. So if you simplify this, you'll come up with 29. That means for this function, this quadratic function, the Y values are approaching 29 when X is approaching 2. So notice that we didn't have to use each limit law separately. We didn't have to look at a graph. We didn't have to use a table of values. We just use an algebraic method. We just use substitution. We plugged in x equals 2 and for all the x's, and we were able to find out the limit very quickly. So number 2, you have the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this product of two functions, x minus 1 in parentheses squared times 2x plus 3. So notice that this function is a polynomial function. So again, we can use the first property. It's a polynomial. I can replace all the x values with whatever I'm approaching on the x-axis. I'm approaching negative 3. So replace all of these x's in the function with negative 3 in parentheses. It turns out that I get negative 48. So the y values are approaching negative 48 for this function as x gets close to negative 3 from either the left side or the right side of x equals negative 3. Okay, and then problem number three, let's try a fraction this time or a rational function. So you have a limit as x approaches 2. The numerator is a polynomial, 4x squared minus 3. And the denominator is a polynomial, 2x minus 1. So keep in mind, the second property said I can, I can plug in x equals c into the function provided that the denominator is not 0. So let's check out to see if the denominator is 0 or not. The denominator is 2x minus 1. If I replace the x with a 2, that's what I'm checking to see if it's 0. So I get 2 times 2 minus 1. That's 3. Since the denominator is not zero, I can use this property. I can just plug in two for all the x's and that's the limit. So you have four times two squared minus three, and then the denominator is two times two minus one. Again, notice that the limit notation's dropped because I'm just evaluating the function at x equals two. So you have four times four minus three in the numerator, four minus one in the denominator, and this turns out to be 13 thirds. So the y values are approaching 13 divided by three, when x is approaching 2 for this rational function. So notice how quick we can find limits using algebraic methods. If the function is a polynomial function, you can just directly plug in that x value into the polynomial function for the x and evaluate to find out what the y values are approaching. For rational functions, you have to be a little careful. Make sure the denominator is not 0 first. Then you can plug in the x values or for whatever the x value is approaching to find out what the limit is equal to. All right, example seven, we're going to again use the limit laws. This time, since we don't know what the functions f of x and g of x are, we will actually have to use the limit laws. We can't actually plug in x is approaching 2, so I can't plug in x equals 2 into the function because I don't know what the function is. So given that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is 8, and the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is negative 3, find each of the following limits. So number one, Find the limit as x approaches 2 of this function. 4 minus f of x divided by 1 plus 3 times g of x in the denominator. So the first thing that I notice is that this is a fraction. So let's separate this out. Let's take the limit of the numerator as x approaches 2 and take x approaching 2 of the denominator, 1 plus 3 times g of x. And then I notice that there's two different terms in the numerator. So I can use a limit law to separate them out. Limit as x approaches 2 of 4 minus limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. The denominator, again, there's two different terms, so separate these out. Limit as x approaches 2 of the first term is 1, plus limit as x approaches 2 of 3 times g of x. And again, if you have a constant times a function, the constant can be taken outside the limit. So the numerator stays the same. The denominator, 
The limit as x approaches 2 of 1, that's already a constant, so one's finished. But the 3 can be taken outside that last limit. 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. And now I can replace all the limits with what the values are that we were given in the problem. Limit as x approaches 2 of f of x can be replaced with an 8. So limit of 4 is just 4. Limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 8. So 4 minus 8. So notice the limit notation is dropped because we are replacing them with the actual values of the limits. And the denominator is limit as x approaches 2 of 1. We know that's 1. Plus 3 times limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. That was given to us as negative 3. So 1 plus 3 times negative 3. 1 minus 9 is in the denominator. And you'll simplify and you get, a, you get 1 half. Okay, let's try one more. This time with a radical function, but it's the cube root this time. So number two says, find the limit as x approaches 2 of a cube root, 8x minus 2 times f of x, plus 9 times g of x. So we know from property number 7 from the limit laws, you can pass the limit inside the root. So cube root of the limit of this entire function that's inside the radical or the cube root. Then I have three separate terms, so I can use the limit law number three. So I can separate these out into limit of 8x minus limit of 2 times f of x plus limit of 9 times g of x as x approaches 2 for each of them. Constants can be taken outside the limit, so 8 times x, 8 can be taken outside that limit. 2 times f of x, 2 can be taken outside that limit. And 9 times g of x, 9 can be taken outside that limit. So cube root. 8 times limit of x, that's good, we have just x left as x approaches 2, minus 2 times limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, that's good because we know what the value of, of this limit is for f of x, and then plus 9 times the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, and again we know what the value of the limit of g of x is as x approaches 2, and so now replace all the values, cube root, 8 times the limit of x as x approaches 2, we know that's 2, so 8 times 2, minus 2 times limit of f of x, that's 8, so minus 2 times 8, plus 9 times the limit of g of x, as x approaches 2 is negative 3, so 9 times negative 3. And so inside the cube root, you'll find out it's negative 27, and then the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. All right, last topic in this video that we're going to talk about is what's called indeterminate forms of type 0 divided by 0. So in example six, we use the limit laws to find out that you can directly substitute in x approaches c, so you can plug in x equals c into a rational function, provided that the denominator was not zero, if you plugged in x equals c. We're gonna find out what happens if the rational function gives you zero in the denominator and in the numerator. So if your x equals c for the rational function is not in the domain, that means that there's not a point there. It will either be a hole in the graph or a vertical asymptote for the function when you graph it, but the limit exists. So that means that the y values are approaching the same value from the left side and the right side of x equals c. So what we're gonna do first is define the concept of an indeterminate form of type zero divided by zero. So let's say you have a function f of x, which is a rational function, so it's of this form, p of x and q of x are polynomials like we've seen before. The denominator is not zero, otherwise we, we would have undefined function. So the property says if you take the limit of the numerator as x approaches c and you get zero, so that means if you plug in c into this polynomial function and you get zero, and you get the limit as x approaches c of the denominator is also zero, so it means if you plug in c into the denominator, you also get 0. So you get 0 divided by 0 if you substitute in. Then this limit of p of x divided by q of x as x approaches c is called an indeterminate form of type 0 divided by 0. So the expression 0 divided by 0, it's not a real number. Okay, 0 divided by 0 is undefined. It does not exist. But it's what's called an indeterminate form we might be able to do algebraic techniques or algebraic methods to actually further investigate the rational function. Maybe the limit does exist if we actually simplify the function a little bit using algebraic methods. The only thing you have to be a little careful about is this last statement. If you do not get an indeterminate form, 0 divided by 0, 
then you cannot actually use algebraic techniques to find the limit. You might not be able to simplify using algebra. So if you do not get an indeterminate form, the limit does not exist. All right, last example, example eight. Evaluating limits, determine if each of the following limits are an indeterminate form of type zero divided by zero first, find the limit if it exists, or provide a reason for why the limit does not exist. So problem number one, find the limit as x approaches one of this rational function. x squared minus x is a polynomial, and x squared plus x minus two in the denominator is also a polynomial. So the first thing I'm gonna do, find out if it's an indeterminate form. So if I'm approaching one on the x-axis, let's see if I get zero divided by zero. If you plug in one into the numerator, you get zero. If you plug in one for all the x's in the denominator, you also get zero. So yes, you do get an indeterminate form of type zero divided by zero. This means that the limit might still exist. You might have to use algebraic methods to be able to simplify the function first. So what we're gonna do is factor the numerator and the denominator to simplify. So let's start the problem over. Limit as x approaches one of the same original function. Factor the numerator. Notice that there's an x in common in the numerator with x squared and x. So factor out the GCF or greatest common factor of x. You have x times x minus one after you factor out the x. And the denominator is a trinomial. There are three terms. So you have x squared plus x minus two. Remember how you can factor these. If you have three terms and the leading coefficient is one, so one x squared, you're trying to find two numbers, two integers, that multiply to negative two, and the same two numbers need to add to the middle term, which is one. And the two numbers at work are positive two and negative one. So that means you factor as x plus two, and the other number that worked was negative one, so you have x minus one in the other factor. So the numerator factors is x times x minus one, the denominator factors is x plus two times x minus one. Notice that there's a common factor in both the numerator and denominator. x minus one in the numerator and an x minus one in the denominator. The reason why we're getting zero divided by zero when we plugged in x equals one is because one minus one is zero in the numerator and one minus one is zero in the denominator. And x times zero is zero and x plus two is times zero is zero. But if you cancel out the x minus one factors, or if you simplify, then what's left over is limit as x approaches one of x, and you have x plus two in the denominator. So we can still find out the limit. So limit as x approaches one of x divided by x plus two. Now we can use a property that we saw earlier. I can plug in x equals one into the numerator and denominator if the denominator is not zero. So if I plug in one into the numerator, I get one. And if I plug in one into the denominator, I get one plus two. So the denominator is three and it's not zero. So that means I can find out the limit by just plugging in x equals one. So the limit is one third for this original function as x approaches one. So again, notice that the limit notation is dropped when I actually plug in x equals one for the x's. Okay, so let's try another problem. Number two, this time we're gonna find out what is the limit as x approaches negative three of x plus five divided by x squared plus eight x plus 15, all in the denominator. So again, this is a rational function. You have x plus five is a polynomial in the numerator, then x squared plus eight x plus 15 is a quadratic function or a polynomial in the denominator. So let's see, if you plug in negative three in for the x's, let's see if you get an indeterminate form. The numerator gives you negative three plus five, which is two. So I already know it's not indeterminate. You have to get zero divided by zero to get an indeterminate form. The denominator, if you actually do plug in negative three into the denominator, you do get zero. So two divided by zero, that's not indeterminate. That's just not a real number at all. That's undefined. So that means a limit as x approaches three, negative three of the original function, it just simply doesn't exist. It's not approaching a real number as x approaches negative three from the left side or the right side. And then number three, let's try one more. The limit as x approaches negative three of this polynomial, four x squared plus 11 x minus three in the numerator and x squared plus two x minus three in the denominator. So again, let's see if this rational function, if I can just plug in negative three, because that will show me if I get an indeterminate form or not. So if you plug in negative three into the numerator, and simplify, you do get zero. 
And same thing in the denominator. You get zero in the denominator if you plug in negative three. So that means that if you plug in negative three into this rational function, you get an indeterminate form of type zero divided by zero. That means we can use algebraic methods like factoring to help us simplify the rational function. So again, factor the numerator, factor the denominator, and simplify this expression, this rational expression. So let's look at the numerator. The numerator is 4x squared plus 11x minus 3. That is a trinomial, but this time the leading coefficient, the number in front of the x squared, is a 4. It's not 1. So how can you factor these? Well, you have to use what's called the AC method, or you can use trial and error if you're more familiar with that. The AC method means you take the leading coefficient, which is the A term, and you have the, the A coefficient, and you multiply with the C coefficient. So you have 4 times negative 3, that gives you negative 12. So find two numbers that multiply to negative 12, and the same two numbers need to add to the middle term, which is 11. The numbers that work are positive 12 and negative 1. 12 times negative 1 is negative 12, and 12 plus negative 1 gives you positive 11. So rewrite this three-term polynomial into four terms. 4x squared stays the same. 11x becomes 12x minus 1x minus 3 stays the same. Try factor by grouping. So group the first two terms together in parentheses and group the last two terms together in parentheses and make sure there's a plus sign between the two parentheses, the two different groups. Now factor by GCF, greatest common factor. The first group, notice that there's a 4x in common that can be factored out. What's left over will be an x from the first term, and you factor out 4x from the second term, you'll have a 3 left over. Notice that the second group both have a negative 1 in common. So you can factor out the negative 1 from both terms, and you'll have a positive x and a positive 3 left over. So what's important is that they both have, both of these groups have an x plus 3 left over after you factor out the GCF. And so now factor out x plus 3 from both groups. So x plus 3 factored out, 4x minus 1 left over. So that's how the numerator factors. So let's go back to the original problem. You have a limit as x approaches negative 3 of the numerator, 4x squared plus 11x minus 3, and the denominator is x squared plus 2x minus 3. The numerator will factor as x plus 3 times 4x minus 1, so limit as x approaches negative 3 of that factored polynomial. The denominator is a trinomial where the leading coefficient is 1. So two numbers that multiply to negative 3, and the same two numbers that multiply or add to 2 are positive 3 and negative 1. So x plus 3, x minus 1 in the denominator. So just like the first problem, notice that the reason why we're getting 0 divided by 0 is because of this x plus 3. Negative 3 plus 3 gives us 0, and negative 3 plus 3 also gives us 0 in the denominator, and that's why we're getting indeterminate form. But if you simplify the rational function first, so cancel out the x plus 3 factors, or simplify, you can find out the limit of what's left over. Limit as x approaches negative 3 of 4x minus 1 in the numerator, and x minus 1 is left over in the denominator. Now, this is a rational function, but I don't think the denominator will be 0. Let's check. If you plug negative 3 into the denominator, negative 3 minus 1 gives you negative 4. And if you plug negative 3 into the numerator, you get 4 times negative 3 minus 1, and that's negative 13. So since you don't get 0 divided by 0, that means you can actually find out the limit using algebra methods. And so the limit turns out to be positive 13 divided by 4. So the y values are approaching 13 fourths, of this original function as the x values are approaching negative 3 from the left side and the right side of x equals negative 3. So notice that we did again we didn't use a graph, we didn't use a table of values, but you could use a graph or a table of values to find out these limits. It's just sometimes it might be faster to find out the limit value if you use algebraic methods like factoring and the limit laws. So this finishes our video on introduction to limits using algebraic methods and the limit laws. And we also talked about how to find the limit of a polynomial function, 
and also a rational function provided that the denominator does not give you zero when you plug in whatever x is approaching. And we also talked about indeterminate forms of type zero divided by zero. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about limits involving infinity.